Welcome to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson and I ask my guests one simple question, why? Focusing on the importance of why, I share with you the relatable, uplifting and inspiring conversations I have with people from all walks of life. This podcast will encourage you to focus on your why to enable and empower you to achieve the success you desire. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why. Before we start, I would like to draw your attention to my weekly email newsletter, Friday Focus. Each Friday, I focus on one topic with one action arising. The link to sign up is in the show notes or head over to amyrolinson.com and sign up right now. Today on Focus on Why, I am joined by Anthony Brinkley. Hello, Anthony. How are you today? I am well. It's such a pleasure to reconnect with you and your audience again. I'm doing great. And I hope I hope you are doing well. Yeah, really well. Thank you. All the better for having you on the show to talk about why you're doing what you're doing. So let's just dive straight in. What is it you're up to at the moment, Anthony? Um, kind of retooling right now to uh, establish some platforms to help people deal with some of these challenging times. And so um, I've been getting these epiphanies about maybe what people are dealing with. So I'm actually turning them into curriculum and exportable data that we can give to people to help them along their path. And that sounds really practical. Is that the way that you used to work? Yeah, it actually is. Um, you know, we say stuff like, hey, well, I'm just human. I'm just a man. I'm just a woman. And I don't subscribe to that. I believe we're spiritual creatures having an earthly experience. And if we can't, if we could connect with that thing that makes us unique, nothing's impossible, nothing's unachievable. If we connect to that spirit that, that drives us and propels us. So I just want, I just want to help people connect to themselves. And I get a lot of my ideas organically. If I can still my mind, then I hear things that help me uh, become more productive. So a couple of things there that I want to pick up on. Obviously, the the spiritual creatures having an earthly experience, I'd love to pull on that thread, but also how you still your mind. How do you do that? Um, you know, we're bombarded with information. And in most cases, uh, the information that we're bombarded with is, is not really good. Well, it's kind of a conflicting statement. I just made it because we're, we're bombarded, but we don't have to be bombarded with information. We choose what we give attention to. The average person is on their electronic device about six and a half hours a day. Only about 25 to 30 percent of that stuff is redemptive to include your show, which is redemptive. So most people are looking at stuff that adds no value. And when you start to pack stuff in that you have to unpack, then that takes away from your ability to cultivate the creativity which re resonates within you. And the spiritual creatures and earthly experience. Explain that a bit more for us, please, Anthony. So I believe that. Um, that there's something that makes us unique. There's something that makes us uniquely confined and configured and aligned. And I believe that um, something greater than myself created everything that I see. And but if I'm not careful, all I all I I will focus on me and myself versus the thing that helped create me and that guides me. It, and if I'm not if I'm not careful, I will I will uh, relegate myself to a human living on this earth. But I actually I was created from a spiritual being. And I believe that spiritual being said, I'm putting you on this earth to leave it better than you found it. I'm putting you on this earth to interrelate and interact with people to enhance their lives and have a, and have a greater purpose, if you will. So I realized once I when I when I think it's just me, then I'm in trouble. But if I realize I have access to unique and infinite wisdom, then I have the ability to navigate through anything. So that's where my spirituality helps me understand that I've been placed on this assignment, like all of us, in my opinion, to have an earthly experience to help people along their path for this time, for this juncture of time. So what is it that you've done up to now to help leave the world a better place than how you found it? Well, it's kind of hard for me to say because I don't really get to grade myself. But what I think I, I've tried to do is to challenge people to be uniquely, unapologetically themselves, because that's where your power, that's where your essence, that's where that's where your, your strength comes from and your purpose comes from. So 
through my training and through the books I've written and through the platforms of teaching and lecturing, I try to challenge people to dig within themselves and extract that gold, mine those treasures within them to go and be unapologetically themselves as they go out and, and make this world better. So my, 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 my goal is to help reflect what's resonating inside of people and take their excuses away to be average because you can be extra. Every one of us has the ability to be extraordinary and simply meaning you are the only one qualified to be you. So you need to be you in an extraordinary way. I love that. And tell us about the, the books you've written and the training that you've done. So I've written three books. Um, one of them was actually a bestseller a year ago. Number one, not that I'm not trying to make anything. I'm just answering your question. But that book was called You Can't Run Away From You. And the subtitle is A Young Man's Journey to Himself. And the reason I wrote that, that book was birthed in pain. Um, because when I was five years old, I was going through chemotherapy for six months. When I was six years old, I saw someone killed in front of me. When I was um, when I was six years old, I had a gun pulled on me. When I was six years old, we had to walk home in packs from school um, as first graders because there were people molesting boys and girls. So I was traumatized at an early age. And what I learned from trauma was that pain projects. And if you're not careful, you can amplify your pain on the other people or pain can be instructive because it tells you where you need to pay attention. So that first book was about dealing with the things that reside within you and letting pain become your mentor versus your tormentor. And then the other two books I wrote, one is called You Better Enjoy Life. It's a six month spiritual devotional that walks you through half the year. And then the other one's called Words to Live By. So, so that's the other six months. So the two books I've written from a spiritual standpoint, they walk you through a year of your life. I love that. And I love the the reframe that you've gone through, having had a traumatic early years to to now changing that from the perspective of using it as being a mentor and not a tormentor. That's, you know, I love the play on words there. Tell me more about those formative years and how they have been in, instrumental in the purpose in life? So for me, um, I, instead of, instead of running to embrace or understand why, what my orientation to myself and the world was, I ran from it. I ran from it through alcohol and other things that would dull my senses so I didn't have to deal with it. Uh, in America, Americans make up 5% of the world's population, but Americans consume 85% of all psychotropic drugs in the world, the oxy, the hydro. And so our culture has been designed to tell people when something does not feel good, dull the pain, ignore it, distance yourself from it. So for me, my formative years were so painful and I did what most people did in my environment. I found a way to escape in a less than appropriate way until I realized you can't run away from you. Everywhere you go, you're there. So I decided that I wanted to do the work, no matter how painful it might be. And I opened myself up to perspectives that I didn't have from other people and different things. And so my, my, my journey became instructive for myself as well as other people. So I just try to um, let people know that it's OK not to be OK. It's, uh, if I had to give a medical diagnosis, I'd say we have a full blown case of life. And so we can help walk each other and unpack those measures. And and going through a problem doesn't have to be fatal, but it can be it can be formative in your life. And is, is it a case, Anthony, of, that you you talk about that full blown case of life that people expect life to be easier, to be more fun, to, to be more plain sailing? Is that what the, 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 the mismatch is in expectation and reality? Yeah, I think that's what life is, expectation management. When people get, when they have relational issues, issues within themselves, it's because they didn't expect what they got or they didn't get what they expected. And so when you, when, when we don't understand what true expectations are by taking a, a, a sober look at our environment, ourselves, the circles we run in, then we run into problems associated with expectation. And I tell people this simply, there is no easy button in life. So what I tell people um, is you have to pick your heart. You have to choose your heart. If you have a problem, it's, it's challenging. 
if you don't change what you're doing or modify it, it's going to start hard. It's going to remain hard. If you choose the hard to say, I'm going to try to address it, it's going to start hard and it's going to get easier going forward. So you just have to choose your heart. And, and that's what I try to challenge people to do. So going from those formative years and then helping yourself getting through those darker moments, what have you been doing? What, what was your career before where you are now? So I was in the, um, well, one, I was a horrible employee as a child. Like I had never had a job more than like three weeks. Matter of fact, I had got fired so many times from some of my locations or, or professions that I used to critique my former employees on how they fired me. I'm like, you can't fire me in front of the fry station while I'm trying to get these fries out and hamburgers. You're supposed to pull me in the back and pull out a file and talk about the gap from expectation to what I actually did. And, and I get three days to do a rebuttal. They're like, just get out of here. You don't work anymore. So for me, um, once I, I was having challenges in my house and I decided that it was time for me to try something different. So I joined the United States Air Force. And so the, the, the prevailing sentiment was he'll, he won't make it through basic training because he's never had a job more than three weeks. And I'm like, hey, I'll take a piece of that. I think I'll be home too. And it ended up turning out to be a 28-year journey that I did. And um, I was able to go to the highest rank in the enlisted corps, chief master sergeant. And I led over 100,000 people, some in combat and other environments. And so I learned a lot about life, fortitude, different cultures, races, myself. So the Air Force was a, um, a very instrumental part in, in developing the person that I became. And then when I got out, I started my consulting company called On The Brink Affirmation Services, where I do executive coaching. I do resiliency training. I do um, corporate training, different things to help people in groups get better. So from somebody who couldn't hold down a, a regular job to somebody who then held down and thrived in the arm, the army and the air force rather for 28 years. What was it? I mean, you said there that it was fortitude, but what was it that held you there for so long? Um, the prayers of a grandmother, <laughs> the prayers of a mother, prayers of a father. And, um, there were times I made some horrible choices. You know, I don't want to sit here and say like my life had been pristine all the way through. Cause that, that would be inaccurate, but there were times when I say I'm a spiritual being, having an earthly experience. There were times where I, I, I had thoughts and insights that I knew didn't come from me. And it didn't even make sense. But some, but it, it sounded so clear to me. And it created pivot points in my life, inflection points, where I actually followed those voices that said, hey, Anthony, this isn't really going to give you the result that you need. You're better than that. Choose the right hard, push through. And, and because of, um, I think, some good support, some divine intervention, and practically speaking, people who look beyond my faults and saw my needs and invested in me. Um, and so for me now, it, it becomes an opportunity, a moral imperative to pay it forward. So through pl platforms like yours, I just want people to know that if you look at my life, you have no excuse to feel like you can't do anything because I should have been disqualified for anything from an affirmative standpoint that happened in my life. So if a guy like me who grew up going in hallways and smelling urine and people are shooting dice and people are stabbing each other and all kinds of things going on. And I did, I made horrible choices. If I was able to come through this then you can too. So you, you really don't have an excuse. And sometimes what we'll do in life, we'll take an excuse and try to turn it into a reason. No, don't make an excuse and don't try to don't try to make an excuse a reason. It, the odds of being born is one in 400 true. So when you were born, you hit the lottery in life. So 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 you playing with house money. And just because it gets hard, it's not an excuse to fall back. Wow. So coming out of the U.S. Air Force and creating this consulting firm on the brink, what is on the brink? mean for you? What what does that term and that expression say? So my last name is Brinkley, of course. So I feel like we're all on the brink of something. And so when I look at the term brink, B is we have to be bold in our lives. R is we got to be resilient. 
Meaning when something happens, I don't want you to just bounce back. I want you to bounce forward so you've extracted lessons from what you've gone through. And I is, you got to be innovative. If you wanted 400 trillion, no one has a thumbprint that you have a fingerprint. That means you should innovate in a way that no one else says. And then in no nonsense, be about your business. Be about what you say. Let your words correspond. Matter of fact, you should let your actions speak. And then when all else fails, then use words. And then K, we need to be knowledgeable. We need to have a dogged approach to acquiring knowledge. We need to be persistent in our pursuit of becoming more knowledgeable. So I tell people through those attributes, my goal is to increase excellence one person at a time. So that's what we try to do. And increasing excellence one person at a time, is, is that the purpose? Is that the vision or is it bigger? Yeah, it's, um, so I remember when I wrote books, I said, I want to sell, like, I want to touch a million people I want to sell a million books. I'm like, I don't really need money. It's not about selling books. And my thought says, I want to touch a million hearts. How do you do that? Amy, when I get on shows like yours and I tell people that you are so uniquely special, the second worst lie in the world is what somebody tells you and you believe it. The worst lie is the lie you tell yourself. So when I went away from trying to get profit and accolades and acclaim, and just to say, I just want to touch your heart in an intimate way, intimacy into me, see, we establish that vulnerability. We can extract what doesn't need to be in there and we can plant what needs to be there. So my goal is to touch millions of hearts because people have touched my heart millions of times. I love that. And I love I love the play on words. I love the 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 way that you've you've emboldened your values through your work. Share with us what your your driving values are. My values are I have been given well, this isn't a value, this is more like a statement, but I've been given an opportunity. Right now, Amy, we're as young as we're ever gonna be for the rest of our lives. As my old friend used to say, it's later than it's ever been. So one of my values is I need to respect time because that's the thing you can spend that you can't reclaim. So I don't want to spend it. I want to invest it. And so what, what we're doing is we're investing in each other. We're investing in each other's platforms and we're investing in the people that's going to give you their time that they can't get back. And we have to, we owe them something for that, that, that vote of trust and confidence in them investing their time. So one, respect time. Two, be who you came to be. And the only way you can be who you came to be is through reflection, introspection, and where needed correction. Reflection, where am I? Who am I? What's my environment? Introspection, how do I feel about it? And, and, and once you feel about what once you determine what you feel about, it, then you say, what can I do about it? And that's where the course correction comes in. So valuing time, living a purpose driven life and being and, and not allowing this world to dim your light. Yeah, absolutely. And you talk there about a vote of trust and confidence. Is that what? potentially held you in in the US Air Force for so long that you had other people's trust and they had your trust too? That was part of it, but it didn't start off that way. I used to tell people this in the military. I would say, I can look at your uniform and tell that you're in the Air Force. What I can't tell is if the Air Force is in you. So what happens is like you have people that go to a, a job and all they see it is as a job. It's a transactional cir circumstance. I do what you ask me to do. I, be, I get remunerated. I get compensated. The problem with having a transactional relationship is people are always looking for a better transaction. So I did, I did a course called Transformational Leadership in a Transactional World. So when I got in the Air Force, it was a transaction for me. They gave me something. I did a job. And, but when I got off, I didn't think about how I reflected my organization. I didn't think about how I reflected myself because it was just a transaction. What helped me was people went beyond transactions. Anthony, 
you have something in you that's unique and you're selling for mediocrity. You are average and you should be extraordinary. And I tell people, my definition of average is you the top or the bottom. Because if you look at, a, if you stratify excellent, outstanding, all those things, average sits on top of below average. So when you average, you the top or the bottom. So people challenged me to be above average. They, they told me they care. And so at that point, when I could trust them, because I had trust issues because I was a, an abandonment issue because I was in the hospital for six months, a five-year-old. When people got close to me, I tried to run. There were people who would not give up on me. And once I let them in, the Air Force got in me. And then I became a better, I became better for myself and everything around me. Yeah, it's it's such a powerful restatement there of, of being in you and and seeing that transformation versus transaction dynamic is is so powerful what i want to sort of pick up on is you you mentioned there about the abandonment and, and being in a hospital for six months and probably feeling really alone although i'm sure you weren't but who did you want to be there that wasn't everyone um imagine you get in the car with your parents your mother your brother and your dad and you think you're just going for a ride I wrote about this in my book. It was cathartic. And three hours later, you get to a facility and you don't know why you're there. You see kids running. You see kids playing. You see people with scrubs on. This was 1970. You see people with masks on. You see people with crutches and wheelchairs. And then I started saying, why am I here? And then my mother kneeled down and said, Anthony, you can't live at home anymore because you're not well. And I'm like, well, my, I don't feel sick. She said, well, that may be. But if you stay home, you're going to die. So it all hit me. They thought it was best not to tell me until we got there. I can't put the value on that other than I was traumatized immediately. So when they all left and when they when they started to walk away and this nurse came to collect me and they went one way and I was going other, I broke away from the nurse and I ran as fast as my five-year-old legs would take me. And when I got within earshot of them, the nurse caught up to me, but I heard my mother tell my brother, don't turn around, don't even look at him. We have to leave him here. And from that point, my odyssey began. And so I was in this, it was like an open bay with beds and cribs and all kinds of, and I would see them take kids out. Kids were dying on a regular basis. So I saw multiple deaths as a pre-adolescent. So I missed, I missed everybody because everything that was associated with normalcy and consistency and safety was extracted. And I saw death on a daily basis as I was going through chemo. So I just missed the ability to be able to connect with people because connection scared me because the people I loved the most in my mind left me. So that, that's what, so it was everything. It was everyone. And do you think, I know it's hard to say now, but do you think that your life has been shaped from that moment and that you would be doing something different if it hadn't have happened that way? It absolutely was shaped from that moment. But the thing is, it didn't have to turn out this way because there were times I was very depressed. I was dependent on alcohol. I wanted to die. And, and while I was becoming this high performer, because that's what a lot of people do that are that are that are that are, that are compensating. That's why I'm not impressed with really successful people, because I, I coach people. I'm a life coach. I coach mayors and executives and NFL players. And so I'm on the other side of my pain. I'm, I'm doing well. But through my studies empirically and practically, I have learned that most successful people are compensating for something that they wish they had. Now, having said that. There are successful people that are well-balanced, but in most cases, successful people are trying to compensate for something. And so I challenge, so I'm not impressed with success. You know, Because in most cases, success means I took care of myself. I'm more impressed with significant people because significant people make their lives about other people's lives. Give me an example of the people who impress you, Anthony. You? And, I, and I'll say that from a, um, a standpoint of um, 
you're being altruistic. You're taking something that you have that you could keep to yourself and you've decided to reach out to be a greater good, greater impact. Um, my grandfather was the same way. He was like five years old. Their house burned down. He lost family members. He never learned how to read because he had to work as a child. And by our world standard, he was a he was a successful person. But his values and his fortitude and his virtue and his his tenacity about taking our excuses away and empowering us to fly, I made him significant. So people like you who say, I'm going to take, I'm going to make a sacrifice with something I can't get back, which is my time, from, and even dealing with your family, you, you're, you're making a sacrifice to give something with no expectation other than, I hope it helps you along your path. So I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for the reminder that you've helped me reflect on. Yeah, and, and it is such a, a powerful thing. And I, I love what you say that, that you're not impressed with success, that it is significance, but not in the sense that a lot of people would say significance means in terms of their significance, but in the significance that they're creating in the in a space. Absolutely. Just want to sort of make that distinction there. I am really stru sort of struck by the moments that you shared here and, and particularly the, the, sort of the moments that you want to share in terms of touching a million hearts, not just a million people, because it's going to the core of who we are and what is keeping us alive and ticking. And, and essentially, you know, seeing you having that trauma as such a young and young person and valuing life and valuing what there is, what is there to come? What are we going to expect from you going forward, Anthony? What have you got planned? So I created a program myself and a, and a good friend of mine. We called it Warrior Heart. And it's, it's designed for the military primarily, but it's really for anyone to answer your question. Because we always say, you know, we're a warrior or we're hardcore or we're, we have this level of tenacity. But we haven't defined what a heart is. And it's, the heart is a repository of your thoughts, your aspirations, your dreams, your pain. It's the central part of your nervous, your, 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 you know, your circulatory system and all of those things that make you who you are. So what I believe, Amy, is that so many people in our world are walking around with a suit of armor on. You can't see it, but it's there. And when you have the suit on, nothing can get out and nothing can come in. But Amy, they've given us a key. The universe, the creator has given us a key and that master key fits right over their heart. And if you hit that key right by establishing trust, empathy, compassion, that key right, that whole suit falls off and then things can come in and things can flow out. And so I tell people the heart of the matter is it's a matter of the heart. We live in our feelings. We live in our emotions. We live in our pain. We live in those places. So if we can help you understand, when you get your heart done, all, of, all we are is heart surgeons. And we reach heart to heart, breast to breast, mind to mind. And that's how we do it. I love that. I really do. And I, I love the, the trust, the empathy, and the compassion that you're sharing. Would you consider yourself as being an empath? I am an empath. And, and, and as an empath, I have to be very careful because I used to carry people's stuff. As empaths, Amy, what I have learned is we're, we're, we're mail carriers. Our job is to deliver the mail, our, our postal carriers. We're, so you give people what they, they can reflect on. You give people what they can think. You give them potential alternatives to their life choices. But they are free moral agents. So once we deliver the mail, we can't carry that mail. Where empaths get in trouble is they try to carry people's consequences, choices, and they become burdened down. So, yes, I'm an empath, and that was something I had to learn because people used to think I was an extrovert because I'm gifted in speaking and extroverted activities, but I'm an introvert. So, yes, to the empaths out there, do not let other people's problems become yours. That's a great message for everybody out there. And, and how would people get in contact with you, Anthony? Um, I have a website. It's um, 
it's on the brink consulting.com all one word on the brink consulting.com or chief anthony brinkley.com i'm on facebook anthony brinkley and um anthony.brinkley at on the brink consulting.com i'll make sure all of those links go into the show notes Anthony, it's been such a pleasure. And I know that we've probably just touched the surface of, of what you have to share. But with that that final note about the heart of the matter is a matter of the heart, it just seems such a great way to sort of round out the, the this episode. And it really is that we are all heart surgeons, albeit, as you sort of say, not in the traditional sense. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I thank you for the time that you've allocated to me. Oh, pleasure. We, we just have to appreciate each day. Um, even though today looks like yesterday, we've never seen today. So let's get back to a childlike abandon, a childlike wonderment, a childlike inquisitive nature and, and, and say, why not? Why not me? Why not now? And um, and you, you've helped me. To, we've created a moment. We could do another interview, but it'll never be like this. So be where you are. Connect where you are. Love where you are. Forgive where you are and live. Thank you for listening to Focus on Why with me, Amy Rowlandson. To show your appreciation and to help other listeners understand what value you have received from tuning in today, please leave me an Apple podcast five-star review. Remember, the conversation doesn't end here. To keep it going, connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter, or join the inspiring, uplifting, and positive Focus on Why Facebook group. All the links are in the show notes. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why.